This year, I've read more books than I've read in any previous year. 102 so far, and we aren't even finished. Obviously, this is something that's very important to me, but reading is a fantastic way to improve your English skills, and also just a great way to learn new things, relax, and broaden your horizons. Since it's getting to that point in the year where you just want to cuddle up by a warm fire and read a book, I decided to share some of my favourite books that I've read so far this year, which I think might also be interesting for you. For each of the books, I'm going to talk about my thoughts, give my personal rating, and then give my difficulty rating for learners. Obviously, I read books for native speakers, but of course, within books for native speakers, there are ones which are easier. So I will give them a rating of one to five for how difficult they are, one being the easiest, five being the hardest. Let's go. I actually can't keep this wrapped up. It's way too hot. I'm probably gonna have to take this off at some point in the video. The first book I want to talk about is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. I was really into Hitchcock films when I was younger, and Rebecca is one of Hitchcock's most famous films. Sometimes when I walk along the corridor, I fancy I hear her just behind me, that quick light step. I couldn't mistake it anywhere. It's not only in this room, it's in all the rooms in the house. I can almost hear it now. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I know. I don't believe it. Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Manderley. Watch you and Mr. De Winter together. So I'd wanted to read this book for a long time, but it did take me quite a long time to get round to it. However, I'm really glad I read it. The book is quite different from the film. The film definitely had to change some things to make it acceptable at the time. So even if you've seen the film and maybe there were some parts you didn't like, I would still really recommend this book. It's a gothic romantic tragedy. So it's very moody, very mysterious, quite scary at parts but it's also got this great suspense going through. I found I wanted to keep reading because you really live inside the main character's head and you see this whole creepy world through her eyes. Basically, it's the story of a young woman who falls in love with a man whose first wife, Rebecca, died, but she was such an amazing, interesting person that it's like her ghost still lives in the house where they live. So the whole time the main character is trying to live up to Rebecca to be as good a wife as she was. And it turns out there are some dark secrets related to Rebecca. What I find really interesting about this book is that at first you think it's a romance, you think it's about, you know, the deep love between the main character and her husband. But as the story goes on, you realize it's more of a cautionary tale. It's really showing why their relationship doesn't work and how successful Rebecca is at pulling them apart. Although I would argue that the husband does as much of the work himself as Rebecca does. He really is not worthy of the main character. She spends all her time and energy trying to be noticed by him, to get him to pay attention to her. And in the end, it's kind of pathetic. I give this book a four out of five because I really loved it. But I think there are definitely parts that haven't aged so well. If you read the book, definitely watch the Hitchcock film as well because the differences are very interesting. In terms of language, like I said, it's a book you don't want to put down. It's very gripping, but it does have a lot of descriptive language. And in particular, it has a lot of old fashioned words. So it is quite, it's quite a challenging book. I would give it a four out of five for difficulty. 
The second book I want to talk about is I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. This is a science fiction classic, and I actually have read quite a few of these um, SF masterworks in this series by Galanch this year, but this was probably my favourite. It's kind of a common idea now, I guess. It's a vampire story, but the vampires are explained by science. But this was the first one that did it, basically. This kind of came up with that idea. So it definitely is one of the best implementations of this style of book. As you can see, it's nice and short. It's only about 160 pages and it's really action packed. It's very easy to read and you can get through the story quite quickly. Basically, it's the story of the last human on earth, or he thinks he's the last human on earth, and everyone around him has turned into vampires. So he hides inside during the day, sorry, he hides inside during the night, uh, because all the vampires are trying to break into his house and kill him. And then during the day, he goes out and collects supplies. So it's a really fantastic book. I gave this a 5 out of 5 for rating because I enjoyed it so much, but I am a massive fan of vampire stories, so it may not be to everyone's taste. In terms of language, like I said, it's pretty action-packed, so there's not loads of descriptions, but there is some difficult vocabulary for describing scientific terms or specific objects, so I give it a 3 out of 5 for difficulty. Also, you may be familiar with the Will Smith film. I've never seen the film. I think it's not a great adaptation from what I've heard. Whereas this book is considered possibly the best horror novel of all time. So definitely skip the film, go straight to the book. The third book I want to talk about is actually a series and I don't have it physically because I listen to it as audiobooks. The series is Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. The first book in the series is called The Final Empire. There are seven books in the series now, but the, th the first three are kind of their own story. And then the books after that are in the same world, but they're set quite far into the future. I only listened to the first three audiobooks, so I can't recommend the later books. Brandon Sanderson is a really popular fantasy author right now. He finished the Wheel of Time series after the author of that series died. And he's very well known for his Stormlight Archive series. Actually, the Stormlight Archive is the series I know him from, and I absolutely love that series. It's probably my favourite fantasy series. I'd heard a lot of people recommend Mistborn because they said it was very accessible for people new to the fantasy genre. Like if you're not sure if you like fantasy, this is the place to start. Also, he has a very accessible style. He doesn't write huge descriptions, you know, his paragraphs are pretty short. In general, I could say his writing style is pretty straightforward, although there are some difficult words. This is a world where magic exists, but it's all related to metal. So people who have magic powers, they have to swallow certain metals in order to do different things like pushing and pulling other metals, flying, um, all kinds of different effects. So if you're into action-packed stories, this is definitely a great one because there's lots of cool fighting using the magic powers. I honestly didn't really love this series. I thought it was good, but I think everything it does well is done 10 times better in the Stormlight Archive. However, the Stormlight Archive is a very difficult series to get into. They are like a thousand pages long. They have loads of different characters. There's going to be 10 books in the series. So if you're not like a big fantasy reader already, definitely start with Mistborn, and if you like the books, maybe consider reading The Stormlight Archive. My personal rating for these books is 3 out of 5, and my difficulty rating is 2.5 out of 5.
The fourth book I want to talk about is Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. This is a classic lesbian novel. It's the story of a young girl growing up in a poor northern mining town in the UK. And she has this crazy, super religious mother who wants her to become a missionary. As she grows up, she has, you know, these strange interactions with the church and this missionary community around her. And then she realizes she's a lesbian. What I really love about this story is it uses a mixture of very comedic scenes from real life with fairy tales and kind of like visions that the main character has. So, you know, you know that I like fairy tales and this book does a beautiful mixture of the two. It's semi-autobiographical, so a lot of this story is based on the author's real life. However, she did also write an autobiography, which is called Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, which I've also read. I don't have the book because I lent it to a friend. I read that first, and I would definitely recommend reading this book first. And then if you really like the author, you're interested to find out more about her life, you can read Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, because they really complement each other. I think you really get a lot from seeing the kind of fictionalized version of her life, and then the actual truth of what happens. This book is short and sweet, it's just over 200 pages, so I give it a 4 out of 5 because I loved reading it. In terms of language, because it's told from the perspective of a child, it's pretty straightforward, it's not too difficult. But there are a few biblical references which might be a bit more difficult to understand if you're not from that background. So for difficulty, I give it a 2 out of 5. The fifth book I want to recommend is, again, a series. I read it in ebook, so I don't have anything to show you, but it is Animorphs by K.A. Applegate. You might remember the TV show from the 90s, I believe. I only saw the TV show when I was a child, but it is based on this very popular series of books. It's about a group of kids who find out that aliens are trying to take over the world, and in order to fight against the aliens, they get these powers where they can transform into different animals. Hi, my name's Jake. I thought I knew who I was, a kid who liked to do normal things, you know, go to school, play video games, hang out with my friends. But the other night, my whole life changed when my friends and I were given the power to morph. You know, change shapes, become animals. So now Marco, Cassie, Tobias, my cousin Rachel and I can become dogs, cats, tigers, hawks, anything. Pretty cool, right? Not when you're the only thing between a bunch of mind-controlling alien yurks in the end of the world. You can't tell anybody, because you never know who's a yurk and who's not. All I know is... Now I'm an animal. Now, I thought this was just some city kids show, but actually the books are very deep and interesting. Although they're clearly aimed at kids, they do have some quite mature themes. For example, in one of the books, one of the other characters, who's not the main character, but she's a friend of the main characters, has been acting kind of strange, she's been very quiet, Later on, they find out it's because the evil aliens have mind-controlled her parents. So her parents are acting very strange with her, and she doesn't understand why. The main characters know that her parents are being mind-controlled by aliens, but of course they can't tell her, because that would reveal their secret identity. So one of the main characters essentially has to see her friend suffering and can't do anything about it. As far as I know, the books are much better than the TV show. They were never officially released as ebooks, so you can actually get all of the ebooks online really easily for free, and it doesn't seem like anyone's going to stop you. If you just Google Animorphs ebooks, you can very easily find a download. You can get the paper books pretty cheaply online, but there are 54 books, so I don't know how easy it is to buy all of them. I've only read the first seven, and I really enjoyed them. They're super short, they're like 150 pages, and they have a very simple style, so you can get through them pretty quickly. So if you're not so confident with reading in English, this might be a great place to start. 
My personal rating is 4 out of 5, and in terms of difficulty, I give it a 1 out of 5. And now I'm going to take this off because it's too much for me. <laughs> I have enough lions here, thank you very much. The sixth book I want to talk about is The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. T.J. Klune is one of my favourite authors. He writes really sweet stories with lots of LGBTQ plus characters. Some of them are romances. This one is not a romance directly, but it does have a romance as a strong element of the story. Basically, it's set in a world where some children grow up with magical powers, but these children are sent to orphanages for the safety of society. The main character is an inspector, so he goes to these orphanages to inspect them and to make sure everything's okay. And he's sent to a very special orphanage that has particularly unusual magical children. For example, one of them is the son of the devil. This book is so, so funny. It's very rare that I find a book that makes me laugh out loud, but I was laughing through a lot of this book. It's also really heartwarming and tender and it will probably make you cry. It's just a really great book if you need something cuddly. So my personal rating for this book is a 3.5 out of 5. It's not my favourite TJ Klune book, but I do really, really love it, and I think it's a great introduction to his books. In terms of difficulty, it's not too difficult, it's pretty straightforward. However, it is quite a bit longer than the other books I've recommended. Well, some of them. It's about 400 pages, and it does have some difficult words. So I give this book a 2.5 out of 5 for difficulty. The seventh book I want to talk about is The Woman in the Purple Skirt by Natsuko Imamura. For a long time I was searching for genre novels from Japan because I wanted to read some Japanese books translated into English and then find the ones I really enjoy and reread them in Japanese. I haven't reread this in Japanese so far, but I'm going to. This is a technique I sometimes use to make reading easier in a foreign language. Basically, the problem I had before was I could find literary books in Japanese that I really enjoyed, but then they were quite difficult language-wise. And then whenever I tried genre books, I didn't enjoy them so much. But this one really hit for me. So it's about a woman who is obsessed with this woman in her neighbourhood called the woman in the purple skirt. At least that's how the main character refers to her. So for the first half of the book, we only learn about the main character through her obsession with the woman in the purple skirt, because she spends all of her time explaining who this woman is and why she's so special and important. However, it's very ambiguous whether the woman in the purple skirt actually is this important or if the main character is just obsessed with her in an unhealthy way. It's quite a short book, it has just over 200 pages, but the font is pretty big, so it's probably really shorter than that. And I guess I would say it's a thriller. What I really love about it is it has a very ambiguous ending. You're not really sure who's correct, who's wrong, who's crazy, who's normal, and that was something I appreciated because it didn't feel like it was judging anyone for being really crazy. You can really interpret this ending how you want. So it's another short and sweet one, and for my personal rating I give this a 3 out of 5. One of the reasons I really want to recommend it though is it has a very simple, straightforward style. It's really fantastic for learners. Obviously it's been translated from Japanese, but I don't think there's anything wrong with reading translations, and I imagine most of you probably don't speak Japanese. So in terms of difficulty, I give this a 1.5 out of 5. The eighth book I want to talk about is How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. And as you can see from all these uh, plastic flags, there was a lot I really loved from this book. I've talked about this book on the podcast before, and I've discussed it with loads of different people. But basically, it's, well, the title is a 
bit misleading. It's not so much about how to do nothing. It's more about how to slow down and do things that maybe seem not important or not productive in our modern world and why it's important to do those things. For example, one thing she talks about a lot in this book is paying more attention to nature, going bird watching, and why that's really important for resisting this attention economy we live in and capitalism and climate change and so on. It also talks about loads of different kinds of art, which I loved. There's just really a lot to get from this book. And it feels very warm, like the author really is inviting you into a comfortable world, I guess. So my personal rating for this book is a 4.5 out of 5. In terms of difficulty, it's actually quite straightforward. There are some maybe technical terms like specific vocabulary, but in terms of the actual structure of the language, it's pretty simple. So I give this a two out of five for difficulty. The ninth book I want to talk about is Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. As you can tell by the cover, this book is kind of erotic. It has a quite a few erotic scenes in it. Basically, it's about a Jewish woman who lives in Los Angeles who is suffering from an eating disorder. She's really obsessed with staying thin, so do be careful if this is a topic that's difficult for you. But she talks a lot about the ways she, you know, plans her food and obsesses over food. But then one day she goes to the frozen yogurt shop, the froyo shop that she goes to every day, and there's a new person serving there who is an orthodox Jewish woman. This woman serves her much more yogurt than usual, and the main character at first is really stressed out because she doesn't want all this yogurt. But gradually she forms a relationship with the woman and they kind of fall in love. Now, even though it kind of seems like a romance, the focus is really more on her eating disorder and their relationship is really a way for her to process her relationship with food, to figure out a healthy relationship with food. Because this Orthodox Jewish woman is very big and fat and just loves eating. And that was really one of the great things about this book is it helps me understand the kind of mindset of someone who has an eating disorder. And then it also represented being fat and eating food and enjoying food as something very positive and in a non-judgmental way, which I think is really hard to do. So I really appreciate the author for doing this. It's also a very funny story. It's got a lot of comedy about what it's like to work in Los Angeles and be surrounded by all of these weird models and actors. And it's got these great erotic scenes, which Look, they maybe aren't for everyone. I think these ones are, you know, they're short and sweet, but they're very well written. And it really does, you know, drive the story forward. They're there for a reason. So for my personal rating, I give this book a three out of five. For difficulty, I give it a two out of five. It's really quite straightforward in terms of language, but there are a lot of references to LA culture and brand names. So just be careful of that. Also, the chapters are really short. Um, it's almost 300 pages, but because of the short chapters, it's quite a short, easy read. So yeah, two out of five for difficulty. The last book I want to talk about is Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney. Again, I listened to this as an audiobook, so I don't have anything to show you. This is a really popular book by a very well-known author, at least in the UK. She's an Irish author and she writes a lot about millennial Irish life. So I feel like I should relate to it because, you know, that's my age group and it's quite close culturally. But I have to say I don't love Sally Rooney's style. Language wise, she uses very simple, straightforward language, which actually makes it great for learners. I don't love that style personally. But the most frustrating thing about her writing that many people complain about is all her characters are very emotionally repressed. None of them are good at talking about their feelings. And there are definitely many points in the story where you feel like, oh my God, if these people just said how they felt, things would be so much easier. But as long as you can get past that, as long as you can accept that, I think there is 
quite a bit to enjoy here. She's very good at realism. Her characters and world do feel very realistic. There's just not a lot of plot going on. So Conversations with Friends is about a girl who is in a poetry duo with her friend Bobby. They perform live poetry together. And one time while performing, they meet Melissa, who is a well-known writer who wants to take pictures of them and write a magazine article about their poetry. They make friends with Melissa and then they also meet her husband, Nick, and the main character falls in love with Nick and they have an affair. And that's basically it. <laughs> that's like the whole story. There really isn't a lot that happens in the story. It's more about the characters. For the first half of the story, I was really frustrated because I just felt like it was going nowhere and the characters weren't developing but it does actually come together in the end and I found myself enjoying it a lot more than I expected to, which really surprised me. So I do think the author is talented. I just think she's trying to do something that I'm personally not that interested in. But I do think this is a great book for learners because it's a contemporary setting. And like I said, the language is very straightforward. The only difficult thing is she doesn't use quotation marks because I guess it makes the dialogue feel more realistic. I'm really glad I listened to it as an audiobook because I would hate having to read a book without quotation marks, but that's just me. The audiobook is actually really good because it's narrated by an Irish narrator who does really good voices for all the characters, so I would actually recommend the audiobook specifically. So my personal rating for Conversations with Friends is a 3 out of 5, and my difficulty rating is a 1.5 out of 5. So yeah, those are all my recommendations. I will write the books down in the description so you can easily access them. If you have any book recommendations from this year, I would absolutely love to hear them. And I'm sure other learners would also like to know what books are easy to read in English or worth reading. So definitely do leave a comment below. If you're not already a member of the Easy Stories in English Patreon, you can join for $5 a month to get these videos one month early. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next month. Bye.